Shona and Trevor Pittman were natives of the island of Jersey. They were elected to the Jersey Parliament, known as the States of Jersey, and their purpose was to improve the circumstances of the islanders. We've interviewed them to hear what happened because they became irritants to the elites that control that island and the consequences for the Pittmans was disastrous. Well, I started in 2005. Um, right. I started a term after me in 2008. And I think for me, it was when I brought um, two propositions. One was to uh, get rid of the uh, dual role of the bailiff, which um, as currently still is, he is the head of the judiciary and um, speaker of the parliament mm. or head of the state. And the second one, I think, is probably more profound, was the vote of no confidence um, I brought in the, the then bailiff in 2008, which was Philip Balash. And that was regarding his um, behaviour uh, when he was attorney general a few years before that in allowing a convicted paedophile to uh, continually work as a, an honorary police officer, which at the time he was titular head of, um, and he allowed this person to continue, and this person went on to, uh, to abuse young women in his office. After that, a few months after that, that vote, uh, there was a, a law passed in which, um, in which people standing for election were not allowed to help um, disabled people vulnerable. and vulnerable people fill in um, applications mm -hmm. for a postal uh, vote to be put on the register for a postal vote. And um, so that was passed. And I, it, during that debate, I said, I, this is wrong. Um, it's never been done before. It was, we believe, I believe, a political move to stop um, because the party that I was involved with uh, was was um, was was actually getting a, doing a lot of things. Very um, active, right? Yes. Now in, in knocking on people's doors, which traditionally a lot of the wealthier candidates haven't had to bother around because you could spend what you liked on campaigns. Where we were sort of grassroots party, so we were knocking on doors. And the interesting thing is that they changed the law in the middle of the election. So in Jersey, you had senators who stood on an island-wide mandate. Now, they were still allowed to do this because the <laughs> law wasn't brought in. Uh, but when it got to the deputies, where most of the party were standing, they brought it in for that. And all this was doing, as Shona says, was to, um, if you were vulnerable or you were stuck in your own home, I would help you complete a form and perhaps deliver it mm -hmm. to say, can I please have a postal vote because I can't get to them. It's not illegal anywhere in the Commonwealth when we looked into it. I mean, it was quite quite shocking, really. But it was to limit. The sad thing about it is it wasn't just to get at the people who were helping these people. It was just to make sure those people who would vote for them wouldn't. They couldn't. Staff, we stood up and said we weren't going to abide by this law um, because uh, in actual fact the states of Jersey were in contravention of the uh, human rights law um, which they were signed up to uh, with their affiliation to the UK uh, in, in, in approving that um, so that's the, the first thing but what happened to us was that um, although there were other candidates and then sitting um, states members um, who had actually done the same thing as us. It was only myself and uh, my other colleague, Jeff Southern, who were um, prosecuted and uh, pursued initially by the police. Um, and it was initially, it went to the magistrate's court, but it was sort of a too much public interest. So it went to the Royal Court, which is the top court in Jersey. Um, it was made a big thing of by the media. Um, and we were um, subsequently prosecuted. But um, in that part of my evidence, uh, one of the, the people who gave the evidence and these people were pressured by the police. And I remember going to, when I was um, canvassing and I went to one, um, one of these people, I didn't know at the time, and she wouldn't answer her door. Eventually she answered her door and she told me what was happening and she was physically shaking. 
And this person was somebody who had learning difficulties as well. So they went for this person, vulnerable person. And the other person actually gave evidence and said, if it wasn't for Shona Pittman, how for me that fall, I wouldn't have voted. Have and voted. he actually said he he actually said that the, the police pressured him. It was being portrayed as if the party, which was the Jersey Democratic Alliance, we were going around um, writing crosses next to our names on yes, a ballot sir. slip. Well, the ballot slips haven't been issued yet. This is just a form mm-hmm. saying, please, sir, may I have a postal vote? But it was spun completely differently in the media. We knew that there are other people who'd done the same but weren't prosecuted. Uh, the bailiff's, former bailiff's uh, brother, who was then attorney general, he denied that there was anyone else who'd done it, but he'd forgotten. He'd actually sent China an email admitting that there was at least another person. <laughs> so, yeah. so I was able to stand up in the States with this. And then he suddenly, you know, they, they suddenly recall. It's a great legal term, which you'll know. Oh, now I recall, mm. you know. But there was more than one person. There was about yeah. five others that we knew of, and two of them um, had been re-elected back in yeah. the States. So. But, but of course, they were taken to court. It was portrayed, it was on the front of the papers, you know, it was the media stories and the TV. And it came down to being, um, Shona had the choice of being fined. I think it was £2,000 for every every person they'd helped or going to prison. I paid the fine. But, but I, I have to say, <laughs> Shona wanted to go to prison and I was concerned about the impact that could have on our lives. So it was me really who crushed it. And I deeply regret that. It was a mistake because I think being people could see going to prison for six months for helping an elderly disabled person receive a postal vote. It's pretty shocking to me. I think it made me me more determined to, to question uh, the the Crown officers. Um, and well, at the same you time, know? of course, you had the child abuse scandal breaking. Yeah, yeah, and, and former Senator Stuart Sivraid really started that ball rolling when he was health minister, um, when things were being brought to his attention. Unbeknownst, you had Graham Power and Lenny Harper, the senior police officers in the island, they were direct, uh, carrying out their own inquiries. Because as this was getting worse and worse, and it, you know, for a long time, that the world's media were camped in the Royal Square. It was Jersey never seen anything like it. You know, you'd have like Sky Van and all these people. And, and because we were asking questions, most, most politicians just wanted it to go away. This was bad for Jersey's image. Finance certainly didn't want us talking about, about child abuse. Um, mm-hmm. So the fact that we kept talking and kept asking questions, I think that year there was a record number of propositions for questions, which meant the state went on longer every, each week. Um, so it was, it, it was an irritant, and it was an irritant that just didn't go away. I mean, our defamation case started, it did, well, we, we, that's when we, uh, after the election, um, we uh, started, we went to our lawyers about the um, well, advert in the, in the Jersey Evening Post. Um, well, it was, it was sort of running concurrently because that was autumn 2008, <laughs> where a lot of this is, is coming to a head and just after I'd got elected, I think I hadn't actually been sworn in yet, or maybe I had just been, but um, the local newspaper ran a big page of cartoons. Uh, all of them were just funny little things, but apart from us, like we were both wrapped in a um, election rosette made out of banknotes, smirking at each other with me saying to Shona, wait, well, four times the salary, darling, so we'd done a social justice platform. Now, I wasn't getting four times a salary. Actually, I took a pay cut of about five grand to go into politics, plus lost, you know, I had to give up my pension and everything. So it was demonstrably untrue. But we decided that we had to take this to court at the same time because it was very damaging to our, you know, we're preaching social justice and how we're just standing to fight for people. Mm. And then people see this wrapped in banknotes. I mean, so this was going on. They, they kept it running. It took, ended to go to court. It took till 2012 to get it to court. So for four years. So for, mm-hmm. throughout this time, we had this court case, which was racking up more money for us, more money for us to, to, to employ a lawyer. 
that was constant and and the battle being fought with the to get the can inquiry was going on i mean i was eventually the chair of a, a scrutiny select committee that um was to look into that how it had been reported operation rectangle which was run by Danny harper yeah he was getting crucified in the media, having grown power, that they wasted money, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'd actually tried to remove me as chairman of the Home Affairs Minister wanted me removed from chairing that select committee. And really what it came down to is the fact I'd voiced a contrary opinion to his. <laughs> it was now, you know, we all go by the, the evidence that we see. So he couldn't get removed. So obviously that was even more in the media limelight because we were interviewing people, we were calling people in. It, it was just dragging people over the coals to try and get them to be what should have been quite honest. You know, this needs to be cleared up. We need some answers. Yeah, I mean, I, I was put forward by education minister. Now there are three people up for it. Um, I was the only professional educator standing. So you might think I'd have a decent chance. I was up against a guy who, nice guy actually, but who I think he was a farmer. And another guy who uh, ran a, I think he ran a landscape gardening business. Now, I came third out of three. And to be fair to the sitting minister, he told me that, he said, I have to say that my wife listened to the debate, to our speeches and all the questions. And she said that you gave my father most informed speech and answered the questions. The best well i would because i was that was my background mm. so like jana says it's it's constantly you're an irritant so you'll be kept mm. down we don't want this uh sort of dissenting voice why this was all going on and the court case was finally coming to court i mean we had a bullet put through our, our letterbox <laughs> with a nice threatening note attached that the next one might be delivered by gun i mean i never told Sharon about that at the time i just kept it um I can remember the former uh, planning minister, because uh, I'd questioned there, there was uh, rumours about a guy in Jersey who had um, meant to be arms dealing. Um, so I asked questions about it. And he said to me afterwards, that, well, you're very brave, but it's not much point being brave if you wind up dead. And I thought, <laughs> I just thought that was a joke, you know, but then after we got the bullet, you think, well, you know, is it a joke? Well, 2013, our court case came to an end and we lost, for 2012, we lost the case. Um, and which, looking back, it was no surprise. I mean, we, I think we went in naively thinking we'd still get some justice. Um, and rightly so, you know, this is our home. Um, and this is where we brought up, I think, your judiciary. Now, despite the past, that you know, there's going to be an element of justice brought into mm. it. Yeah, we lost the case. And it was decided, let's say, by these two lay judges. Within about 10 minutes, it was, yeah. it was decided. And it, it turned out that one of the lay judges, um, he, and this is evidence as well in two uh, official reports, which are public, but they're not... Um, a lot of people don't know. No, widely, no. They're not widely known. And um, this one of the judges um, had formerly worked at, um, at the Victoria College and he'd been a teacher. And uh, at the time, at one time during, uh, there had been a, a child abuse going on. Yeah. Um, and a child had come to him and complained about uh, the abuse and he basically um he literally said according, according to the young person um he made a statement to the police about this we learned later that he'd literally been bullied into silence when you had the care inquiry which we helped bring about took a lot of time to do and eventually that cost about 24 million pounds a police officer came forward a former police officer now he'd been the uh, investigating officer at victoria college and he highlighted the fact how they had wanted to prosecute Miss Jura and how they were blocked. And, and he said, it's in his evidence, the care inquiry, that uh, what was stressed to them was that no Jura had ever been uh, prosecuted for anything. A few years later, uh, the other Balash, William Balash, actually brought this guy out of retirement and 
what did he do? He sat him on one of the most infamous child abuse cases that Jersey's ever had, the Barrett case. So he's brought out of retirement, this guy, who the police had wanted to prosecute for covering child abuse, and he was placed to sit as a juror on a number of child abuse cases. Well, this is the thing. If we'd known that such a person, let, let's be honest, we were two of only perhaps five or six politicians who stood up for the abuse survivors. And who's deciding our case but a guy who we would later learn the police had wanted to prosecute for what he'd done. Mm. Um, and it goes right back. The person who'd been Attorney General when this guy was, the police had wanted to prosecute him, uh, was a guy called Michael Burt, Sir Michael Burt. He was Attorney General. And the bailiff was Sir Philip Balash. Um, when you get to our court case all those years later in 2012, who appointed this guy to sit on our case but Sir Michael Burr, who is now bailiff? So he can't say he didn't know about this juror act. But of course, we, we didn't know all this information when we went to court. It was only about a month later that people got in touch with our lawyer and ourselves. And initially they said, well, this guy, because he's a juror, he's also got a friendship with another juror who was a very high up figure uh, on the board of directors, I think, with the newspaper who published this cartoon. So for us initially, you think, well, that's a conflict of relationship. If you could actually prove that they've been going to dinner at each other's homes. We didn't know about his, his involvement in the uh, Victoria College scandal. Because when we did start to learn about this, uh, we think, well, this has got to be, we've got to appeal against this. Um, and you meet another sort of wall of the way Jersey works. Because the appeal court in Jersey, although it's appointed in Jersey, it's actually, well, it's not appointed. They, they choose who they want, and then it's a rubber stamp from England, the Queen. Um, because we lost the, uh, the appeal, which meant we had massive debts. Um, yeah, well, we obviously had huge costs for our own lawyer, but then you had two people who we'd had to take the court because we had to take the Evening Post, the, the newspaper, who'd run the advert, and we had to take to court the person who had uh, commissioned the cartoon. So that was two, two people, you know, so it was massive. I think we were naive to think that we could ever uh, receive justice just because we were clearly right. What well, happened? what happened afterwards um, was that um, the, the Viscounts Department, which had been nice to us um, up until this point, um, they, they're part of the, their department of the judiciary. And what they did, unbeknown to us, and I can't remember exactly, we found out the very last minute from them, I believe it was an email, that they'd given the list of our debtors um, to the local channel, uh, the local television station, television, um, the channel television. And um, in that um, was our tax, what we owed on income tax. Just like any other and normal that person. Is, would, that is actually yeah. illegal to do that. To and so what they were doing we was... To get, why they did it was to give the impression, I think, um, to sending out to the media was giving another impression. Actually, um, irresponsible. Yeah, irresponsible with our money. Oh, uh, so this was also about our ruining our reputation even further after the case. You know that they rubbished our, they rubbished the case first, um, saying it's about freedom of speech of the press, and then. And, and it was nothing really, and and then it was uh, about a financial situation, and and this is with you know Jersey's we've already said there's lots of connections there. Mm -hmm. um, you know the Jersey Evening Post used to be owned by um, the former um, chief minister, um, and Channel Television. Uh, once we we actually met a couple of ministers, senior ministers actually having drinks in a hotel. Um, and we, we actually, by accident, um, came across that, um, having a, a drinks with the husband of the director of Channel Television. So there's lots of links there. Yeah. And they do a very good job in um, 
portraying um, lefties, vociferous lefties, as um, something other than what they really are. Yeah, I, I, you know, people who care about what I they're think, doing. And I think what puts this in perspective is they actually done a lead program on the news, mm -hmm. and it's called the Pittman Files. And that's what they did. They, they highlighted all. Now, we had no debts apart from income tax. We had to pay that year, like most people, you know. So we went reckless with our money. And yet when I tackled the Viscount about it, well, he wouldn't speak to me himself, so it was one of his minions. But they said, oh, it'd all just been a mistake. So there's no action taken against channel television for it, you know. So you've, you're sitting there. You've already seen this done to you, which is obviously so corrupt. And then you're, you're splashed across an elite story, the Pittman. But all they'd even highlighted the fact that Sean had missed, I think it was an Institute of Directors dinner, so they claimed for the £25 offer. It's really, you've got to consider how complicit the UK authorities, because, you know, the UK do have, they should intervene on doing ensuring good governance and the law and all, and the rule of law and order. Now, when all this has happened to us, um, I actually got through to the Justice Minister at the time in the UK, who was then Tom McNally. And I highlighted this, you know, I actually got, it must have been a quiet day because he actually answered his own phone, which I didn't expect. And I said, have you received our letter? First he denied he had, but then he went away, came back, and he had our letter. So I'd set out together, we'd set out all that we'd been talking about. And he said, well, I'll have to look into it, then I'll get back to you. <laughs> when we got a letter from Lord McNally, I think he is now, um, I may be wrong on that, but what he said in his letter was that, unfortunately, all I can do is refer you back to Jersey's bailiff. Because we'd had our court case, lost it. We'd appealed locally and lost it. The UK then declined to intervene, which is what Lord McMurray had done. Because when we, we put a huge file, must have been about seven inches thick, to Strasbourg, because that was, that's the next stage, and you know it would take years. But then you find out from Strasbourg that actually they won't even look at it because you've not completed the domestic cycle because the UK won't intervene. So where do you go? I mean, unless you're a multimillionaire with deep pockets, that's the end of the story. And when I finally went back in 2018, I think, for the, um, the bankruptcy to be lifted, funny enough, who presided over? But William Balash. Oh, <laughs> William Balash again. And he actually tried to stop the Viscount lifting our bankruptcy. Now, he had no grounds because we'd gone along with everything. And he actually asked the Viscount, uh, I, have I got any means that I can stop this? And the Viscount said, well, no, they've, they've adhered to everything that's been asked of them. But it's quite funny, really, because you're not allowed to speak in these uh, hearings, apparently. But I insisted. I said, the Viscount, well, no, I am speaking. And I stood up and I so what do you want to say, Mr. Pittman? I said, well, I just want to give the court a chance to apologise for the corruption that has been, been carried out to us, which obviously didn't, he didn't take very well. And he said, well, why are you saying this? You've got no evidence. And, of course, I actually had a copy of the police officer's statement from the um, care inquiry. <laughs> so he had, to, he had to go in and look at it and read it. And then he, he said, oh, it's just the word of one man, Mr. Pittman. It counts for very little. You know, I was tempted to say, actually, it isn't one person, is it, bailiff? It's two, because you've got the child who's complained about being abused, and you've got the police officer who took the statement. And yet that counts for very little. And it's funny when you mentioned lawyers earlier, because I happened to chat to a, a lawyer I knew to a small degree that day, and I showed him the statement from the police officer, which he'd never seen. And he says, I find it absolutely shocking, but not surprising. But he said, you've got to understand that it's more than my job's worth to say anything about it. For me, I mean, I went into politics hoping to be uh, to be involved in changing policy, you know, for, mm. for, the, for, for the best. And um, I couldn't be part of that um, because of my, my, who I was, you know. Yeah, and that's probably the thing that's saved us, really. We know we did the right thing, you know. It, as Neil from Voice for Children always says, you know, we know at the end of the day we were on the right side. For me, I think it's, I've, I've lived my principles and I'm very yeah. proud of them. Um, and I'm very proud of Trevor. Um, and certainly um, it's, uh, yeah, it's done lots of good as well. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, we, we yeah. did. People can disagree with your politics, whether you're right or left, and that's fine. But um, we were, as we said we would be. I think I would rather be here um, and, and, and done what I've gone through, what I've, I've gone through, um, and lost what I've lost, than still be in the States and living in fear um, and deference of these crown officers, which is um, what holds a lot of people, a lot of politicians back mm. um, in questioning them. And at the end of the day, you know, it's like people, if people got together more, if the pol more politicians got together, and there's a substantial group of them um, saying, no, you cannot, this cannot happen. Um, also the dual wall has to go. Um, we're gonna question you. Um, and also we're gonna have a, a, a Minister for Justice, which attempts have been um, tried at um, getting one, but it hasn't happened. And if those things happen, we wouldn't, ha we wouldn't be, we wouldn't have this. But mm -hmm. it's down to politicians. They're elected by the public, but they're not questioning these um, Crown officers. Yeah, we've, we've tried to do the right thing, you know? Yeah. And it started out doing the right thing for other people. We've had to try and do the right thing for ourselves. But, um, yeah, it's been difficult, but we're still here.